and you too. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of uh, Juri Albrecht, the Managing Director of the Bali, I welcome you to this event uh, in the series Grunberg Meet. Tonight I'm meeting Deborah Feldman. It was not announced on the side of the Bali, but obviously the discussion is going to be in English. Um, before I introduce uh, Deborah, um, I will tell you short something about what you can expect tonight. I will talk uh, with Deborah for about one hour, one hour, 20 minutes. After that, uh, you can ask questions. There will be Q&A. Anna Marijn will be walking around with a mic. And uh, for those of you who have been here before, uh, please ask questions, no statements, no monologues, no anecdotes from your own life. This, if you want to share these things with Deborah, you can do it afterwards um, in the cafe. Deborah, I will um, say something about you uh, to inform the public, those, of you, those uh, people in the public who uh, don't know you. Deborah Feldman was born and raised in the Hasidic community of Satmar in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Her marriage was arranged at the age of 17, and a son was born two years later. At the age of 25, she published uh, the New York Times best-selling memoir, Unorthodox, The Scandalous Rejection of My Hasidic Roots, and two years later, she followed up with Exodus, a memoir of post-religious alienation and identity. Her work has been translated into Hebrew and German, and currently she's working in two mediums, film and writing. She's most interested in exploring the intersection between globalization, religion, and identity. Deborah lives in Berlin, Germany, with a 10-year-old son. It's 11, I know, but this is all coming from your website, so I guess you, you agree with what I just said. And also, I have to inform you that in one week, um, Deborah will publish in Germany her new book, um, Überbitten, which is the first book what's, that was published, that is being published in, um, with, in German, and I thought that it was written by you in German, but you collaborated closely with a translator. Yes, that's yeah, correct. That's, yeah. Okay, um, I'd, I'd like to focus on, on Orthodox, also because over dinner you told me that Exodus, your second book, was... You're not completely happy with the English version of, of this book, but we will talk about it a bit. So I, I will go through the book, and um, I hope then we can um, discuss all the important matters of, of your work and of things that are uh, of interest to the two of us. One, one more remark, we met in, in November in Vienna at a conference on Jewish identity, where we were sitting on stage together. I uh, didn't know Deborah at that time. And during the discussion, I said, well, the, I'm very glad I'm very, that I, I, I don't look Jewish at all, so I can pass on for... Um, this is exactly what happened. For, for just a white man, a Caucasian. And then Deborah said, well, at, in Vienna, the people didn't laugh. But well, Deborah said, we just didn't notice. I didn't know, but then Deborah, you said, come on, you look almost like a yeshiva bocher. You remember? <laughs> and then the people started laughing, and I still disagree with, with Deborah. I still believe, but maybe this is my naivety that I can pass on. Self-delusion, I cannot uh, cure yeah. it. But we can do, okay. On the first pages of Unorthodox, you write a... Yeah, you come in silently, please. <laughs> Shame is all I can recall of my feelings for my father. When I knew him, he was always shabby and dirty, and his behavior was childlike and inappropriate. Since shame is for me so much connected to um, Jewish identity, I found it interesting that for you it's connected to your father much more than to being Jewish. Yes, I did not experience shame in connection to being Jewish when I was in my community. This comes much later, because in the community it's the ultimate normalcy, it's the ultimate um, factor or um, attribute that binds you to your family and to your neighbors. But, of course, what made me different was that my father was mentally retarded. And um, this I was ashamed of. I was ashamed of the things that made me different in this world that is very different in its own way. But within, it's very conformist. And when exactly was the moment when you felt ashamed of being Jewish? If you ever felt this way? Have you ever... I would say that when I left my community in the beginning, I tried to do something that is called in America passing, which is what people with white skin in America can do. They can try to put on Americanness like a costume and hide... Uh, 
anything about them that makes them different, and that's what the melting pot is. The melting pot allows you to to become American, and in that sense, for the first few years, I did not advertise being Jewish, I did not bring it up, um, and people did not ask the question or assume, because in the States, it is largely difficult um, for Americans to figure out what attributes would identify you as Jewish. In Europe, it's not difficult. In Europe, everybody asked me if I was Jewish. But in America, many of the women I met in university would say to me when they found out that I was Jewish that they had never met any before, or at least they thought they hadn't, because no one had ever mentioned it in their presence. To get one thing clear, you grew up in, in New York, but you didn't identify as an American, even though no. you didn't know. I did not receive an American education. I, I did not speak the language. Um, I did not grow up with any of the American cultural values. I didn't grow up with television or, or, or radio or, or newspapers the way that normally culture seeps in. Um, so when I left my community, it was like being in a strange country, speaking a strange language. I mean, everything was new. And I knew that on paper I was an American. I had the right documents, but I could not connect to the culture or the identity. Yiddish was your first, is your first language, your yes. mother tongue. So when did you start to speak English? In college, because I, I was uh, reading secretly as a child and sneaking into libraries to read books, and this is how I picked up my vocabulary. But when I arrived at the university, I had a very thick accent, and I was pronouncing the words um, improperly because I had only ever read them, I had never heard them. So the first thing that happened to me was I took my first class, and the professor says, where are you from? Your accent is so heavy. And I was so humiliated that I didn't talk for the rest of the class. And I, instead, I would listen to other people speak, and I would try to copy them. And I learned um, to copy any American accent. I would speak uh, like the Texans spoke when I was next to them, but then like the ones from Chicago when I was around them, I would just parrot back the way other people talked. So you pick up accents easily? I do pick up accents easily, but I cannot do a Dutch one. I'm very sorry. No, no, no. That, but I was asking because now you live in Berlin. Um, your German is, is, I have heard you talk German. Is almost it's without an accent. So do you, do people ask you are you from Berlin in Germany or people do and when not, you go to Bavaria, do you become a Bavarian um, in your language? I think I, I tend to like let sometimes local accents color my Aussprache, mm -hmm. um, but I worked really hard um, to blend in and sound neutral the way I did in America because it's important I think to my sense of survival to sound neutral. But I have noticed in the past year that people do no, no longer ask me where I'm from. They assume I'm from somewhere within the country. They don't know exactly where, but they assume that I am um, educated enough and have traveled enough to make my Hochdeutsch more neutral. But they recognize you as a German. They don't recognize me as non-German. I think that's more important. And they don't ask you whether you're Jewish or not. <sighs> um, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. It depends on the circumstances. We'll come back to that later. You mentioned books already. Um, on page 20, you wrote, I don't have a library card, so I can't take books home with me. I wish that I could, because I feel so extraordinarily happy and free when I read that I'm convinced it could make everything else in my life bearable. If only I could have, could have books all the time. Yes, That's quite I still a believe this. You still believe this? <laughs> yes. I mean, I still feel that my, my life is centered around books and reading. And when I'm having difficulties, like emotionally or psychologically, I tend to withdraw and I do a lot of reading. And um, this brings a familiarity the way sometimes maybe some people like to eat foods from their, that remind them of their childhood or, or spend time in places that they remember from their childhood. And I remember being lost in books. And so when I lose myself again, I go back to this, the familiarity and the security of what it is to be a child. But books were forbidden, at least these books. Yes. Or most, even, even, even uh, reading a Talmud was forbidden. Yes, for girls. For girls, yeah. I, um, when I was Maybe, older... Uh, do all people in the audience know what a Talmud is? Are there people who... I see a lot of nodding heads, but nodding? some confused faces. Be, 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 it's not a, it's not, nothing to be ashamed of if you don't know what Talmud is, but please say so. <laughs> please explain short, briefly what, what Talmud um, is. So... The tradition of Judaism has always been passed down through texts, and not just biblical texts, but also handwritten commentary on the Bible. And there is a collection of uh, commentary 
on the Bible written by rabbis in the early diaspora, and they have been published in many, many, many volumes, many volumes. We are talking about a bookcase full of books written by these rabbis, and each uh, volume has its own title and has its own special subjects, and this is called the Talmud, and it's uh, today still studied by Orthodox Jews. So it involves men sitting at a table, reading uh, the paragraphs, discussing them, memorizing them, reading the different opinions from later rabbis, uh, pulling out another book from the bookcase uh, that has been published recently by a rabbi comment commentating on the commentary that's commenting on the commentary. It's a long tradition of discussion and debate that is documented. It Thank is, you. however, forbidden to women. For, in your community. And there is a reason. Yeah. They, they explained yeah, it to I'll come, come to that later also. Okay. And also, when the, I, I said before that Deborah called me Yeshiva Bocher. For those of you who don't know Yeshiva Bocher, Yeshiva Bocher is somebody studying the Talmud and Mishnah all day long. And that's why their Thank skin the is compliment. very pale, because they never see the sun. Never. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> You're so kind to me. I'm as kind to you as you are to me. I know. I know. <laughs> we like each other. Um, so you... you we, you were raised by your grandparents, and now I'd like to um, quote a bit about your grandmother, who is an extremely important figure in your life. Um, Booby, she's called. Still, after multiple appeals, Booby finally capitulates and takes a razor to her head. She always tells me, the shaving you think was such a big deal? Not a big deal at all. I got used to it so fast, and honestly, it's so much more comfortable, especially in the summer. It was nothing in the end. She says, sometimes it sounds like she is trying to convince herself and not just me. Why did the rabbi decide that the women have to shave their heads, I always ask, if nobody did that in Europe? Bubi hesitates for a moment before answering. Zadi tells me that the rabbi wants us to be more ehrlich, more devout than any Jew ever was. He says that if we go to extreme lengths to make God proud of us, he will never hurt us again like he did in the war. So the, the, the Satmar community didn't shave their heads, at least the female, the women uh, in Europe, and then suddenly your grandmother was forced to shave her head. For the second and, time. Yeah, for the second time. But all this statement that, 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 that if, if you are devout enough, uh, there will be not another holocaust, so there will be no more... Um, Yes, there is a really uh, very easy logic behind that, um, which is that uh, the Jews uh, um, b believe that they are in exile. They uh, lost their temple twice because of sin, and when the second temple was destroyed and they went into exile, they uh, um, swore an oath to God, and they said, uh, we will accept our exile. We will not take up arms and go back to the land ourselves. We will not try to build our next temple, we will wait and accept our exile and not um, try to uh, rebel against these authorities because we need to work off the sins of our past and earn enough to deserve an eternal third temple that will never be destroyed. And when they made this promise, um, this is a in Judaism you're not allowed to swear. It's a very, very rare occasions when you are permitted to swear. And to break an oath has a punishment called in Hebrew and Yiddish uh, kores. Um, it, this means to be cut off, but it's a very specific kind of being cut off. Um, it describes a uh, cutting the, of the thread between every soul and God. God cuts the thread between himself and the soul. The soul is lost forever and has no chance at redemption. This is the, the um, uh, punishment for breaking this oath. And uh, we know the story of Noah and the ark. Uh, Noah asked God, please, next time, when you get very angry and you want to destroy the world, can you send a warning first? And then God promised to send warnings. And so, um, when- Very kind of him. Yes, uh, he's yeah. a very kind man. Um, in, in, in Europe, after the movement of Hasidism really took root and spread, um, we had at the same time these competing movements, uh, the Enlightenment, the Haskalah in Hebrew, and its Zionism. And uh, the Hasidic Jews perceived these movements as enormous threats because they were examples of going against this oath, because the enlightened wanted to free themselves from exile by assimilating, by uh, uh, throwing off the yoke of the diaspora and of oppression that uh, God had uh, judged them to. And the Zionists wanted to say, we are not waiting around for the Messiah, but we are going to go to Israel and take it back ourselves. And the, the Satma Rabbi in particular was already preaching in the early 20th century that the punishment 
um, for this is so big that God will send a warning before he will cut the thread. And the warning will be like a pre-apocalypse. He warned of this already because if you look back at the pattern that we grew up learning about of pogroms and crusades and the Inquisition and all the ways in which um, the European Jews were persecuted, the rabbi um, believed that something like this would happen again. And when he came to America after the war, he explained that the Holocaust was a part of a pattern of warnings to Jews in the diaspora who were trying to free themselves from the diaspora. More than that, because you are here on uh, page 35, assimilation, my teacher always says, was the reason for the Holocaust. We try to blend in, and God punishes us for betraying him. That's quite a statement. Yeah, I mean, we are, our one job is to be very loyal to our traditions and uh, to remember where we come from and who we are and that we are always different. I mean, I want to come back to this uh, explanation that my grandfather always gave me when I asked him, why do we speak Yiddish? because I didn't understand how it could be a holy language. It was so similar to the language of the people who killed their families. Mm -hmm. And my grandfather explained to me that it didn't matter where Yiddish came from. What made it holy was that it was different from the language around us. So he said the reason that the Jews were saved in Egypt um, were three. Uh, in Hebrew you say Shem Lashon Malbish. It means uh, name, language, and clothing. And he says at the time there were no Jews, they didn't have a Jewish language or a Jewish way of dressing or Jewish names, but they were different from the Egyptians. It didn't matter what they were, as long as they were different, as long as they isolated themselves. And so the community decided it didn't matter where the language was from, as long as it wasn't the language of the Americans. It didn't matter that the clothing was from 18th century Russia, as long as it wasn't the clothing of the Americans. And our names, by the way, were, were German words. I mean, the names for women, I'm thinking of my aunts, Feige, Taube, this means Vogel, Taub, these are, these are German words, and these were our names. These were not Jewish names. I thought always that Hasidim spoke uh, Yiddish because they didn't want to speak Hebrew, that was considered a language that was too holy for uh, daily use. But you say Yiddish is the reason we, we, because to prevent assimilation. And the same goes for the clothes and the hats and everything and the wigs. Yes, Just to create to, uh, barriers. To, re to create barriers yeah. between the community and the outside world. Yeah. I mean, there is no lexicon for our language. Like the, the Yiddish I grew up speaking, there is no written down version of it. Um, it's not accessible. It's highly censored. It's been purified of all dirty words and words that are dangerous, like love. We didn't have a word for love. So you cannot t talk dirty in Yiddish? No. <laughs> Although um, they invented one word for, am I allowed to say a curse word here? Yeah, absolutely. You can say anything. anything. They invented a word for fucking that is in um, Yiddish trennen, and in German that just means to separate. Yeah. But if you can kind yeah. of create a visual, maybe you can understand why that would be used as a dirty word. That's a dirty word in Yiddish. Trenne. Trennen. Trenne. To separate. To separate, interesting. Yeah. Did you did you ever believe that that the Holocaust was a punishment for because that was that was what people in your community taught you for for the assimilation and for the Zionism, for the misbehavior? I was really confused by all those messages that I heard as a child um, because I was trying to reconcile everything I was learning with the woman who was raising me, my grandmother, and I just thought to myself, it cannot be that someone like my grandmother was punished. Like, I don't understand this concept of punishment because they always say, God, uh, we are made in the image of God, right? Um, so we are kind of examples, like little mini examples of God. And I used to look in the mirror and I, I would say, I'm not evil. I'm not angry. I'm not desiring of punishing someone. So it cannot be if I'm made in the image of God that he is also this way. So when I was really young already, I was kind of poking holes in all the theories. And I began to suspect that this ideology that I was surrounded by was a result of trauma. That the people who are raising me and who are educating me were so traumatized by this collective event that this was their way of coping, in a sense. How old were you when you realized this? I would say like uh, the age of bat mitzvah, bat the mitzvah, maturity. Years old. Yeah. yeah, I think when uh, by the time I was twelve, it had become clear enough to articulate. But you couldn't talk about it. No. No. There's something about survivor's guilt that you write also about in your book. Zaidi, your grandfather, also an important figure in your life, comes from a legacy of oppression. His ancestors lived in Eastern Europe for generations, enduring programs that are not unlike the persecution during Hitler's reign. I can't comprehend how a person who comes from so much pain 
and loss can perpetuate his own oppression. In small ways, Zaidi cages himself, depriving himself of harmless joys, and yet it seems the very deprivation fulfills him. It's guilt that drives my grandparents to inflict continuous suffering upon themselves and upon their grandchildren, if I may say so. Yes, there is a lot of guilt in, involved in the act of surviving the Holocaust. And um, both my grandparents did not understand why they survived and felt that they had an enormous responsibility and that they had not deserved it. And they struggled the rest of their lives to atone for the sin of surviving. And um, they were prepared to sacrifice everything. And I, as a child growing up in that home, um, I came to believe at a very early age that any pain I experienced was not legitimate because it was not comparable to the pain of my grandparents and um, that I was somehow responsible to carry the legacy of their trauma. Maybe you should also explain why your mother was absent. Your father was, as you already said, mentally ill. He couldn't take care of you. And your mother left you when you were quite young. She left the community and uh, she fell in love with another woman. My, my, yes, my father um, was, they say, born mentally retarded, but the problem is in this community, marriage is of ultimate importance, and everyone must marry and everyone must produce many children because this is how we build the community, but also how we replace those we've lost. And my father was the seventh of, of 11 children, and when it came time to marry him off, which happens quite young, um, nobody wanted to give him their daughter so my family Obviously, yeah sense, my family yeah. had a major problem because there were siblings waiting for him and in this community we do not skip siblings we go in the order of chronological age so he had siblings Why is that, by the way in order to make sure that nobody is left out That's... yes there is there's is a very strict sense of order with everything and um, everyone marries young and if you have siblings that are close in age then it's like chick chuck you have the first one married off of 18 a year later the next one a year later the next one i mean it's just one after the other but you don't skip because there is a concern that if you do, um, one, one will lie around waiting forever. Um, so he had siblings that were getting older and, and especially um, younger sisters. And when you get uh, past the age of 18, 19, you really become like unfresh meat. I mean, it's just a very unattractive uh, prospect. Unfresh meat, that's nice. Yeah. yeah. And um, so they were really desperate and they realized it's not going to work in the community. So their plan was to find uh, a, a Jewish girl from a, a community far away that was maybe poor and disadvantaged and they would offer her money and an apartment and jewelry and um, to distract her with the things and they found my mother who was from a Yekisha family, a German Jewish uh, refugee family which already in my community is a very big stigma. German Jews are in my community the lowest of the low because they are the wannabes, they are the ones who wanted to assimilate, yeah. who wanted to be better. Even lower than, because also the Israeli Jews are quite low in your community, no? It, yes. You wrote that, that finding a woman... But they are still Jews. They are still Jews and the German Jews are... German Jews are halfway Germans. Okay. It's just complicated. Yeah. They are called Yekes and the language they speak is called Deutschmerisch because it's a kind of Yiddish that's so supposed to be fancier and so we used to make fun of them and say they're speaking Deutschmerisch because they really want to sound Deutsch but they are not. You know why they're calling, being called Yekes, no? Yes, of course I know why they're called Yekes because of the long jackets. Yeah, yeah. Yekes means jackets in Yiddish. Yeah, yeah. genau. Um, so uh, when they found my mother, it was already like, okay, they had to step way down and they, they settled for a, a girl from a Yekesha family and she, her parents were divorced and they were very poor and um, sh they offered her a seven room apartment in Brooklyn and uh, so, uh, such a, a prospect of such a prosperous and uh, comfortable future that I think, I mean, she was 17, uh, she was of course delighted and did not meet my father until the wedding. So it was only after the wedding that she realized that she's with a man whose mental age is that of a seven-year-old child. And my mother was actually quite intelligent woman, so I think this was really tragic for her. And then add that to being in a foreign country completely alone, having no friends, and the whole family treating you as something of a charity case because they all know that they pawn their sick brother on her. I mean, it was really a disaster. And I think from when I was, you know, when she had me, and this is some stories that my family told me and I can't be sure, but I think she had a very severe postpartum depression and then um, I was handed off to uh, family members. And then later um, she was already starting to sneak out, get jobs, earn money. And by the time I was 
entering the um, uh, elementary religious school, she had pretty much disappeared. And I found out later that she had gone off to be with a woman that she had identified as lesbian and that in the community this was just a scandal piled upon the scandal of divorce, piled upon the scandal of my father's mental health. I mean, there were so many scandals in the, in the story of my parents' marriage that I became a walking reminder of this. My whole family would look at me and they would see the stain that, that was seeping into all of their bloodlines and it was horrible and I never understood as a child why everyone treated me with so much resentment because I had not done anything wrong. And then later I would understand that I represented the failure of my parents, and that I was um, this, this uh, proof, proof of this fleck, this stain. Okay. And, and then you caused another scandal by leaving the community. I yes, I did. And you know what? I have distant cousins that cannot get married because they're related to me. I feel sorry, but that's how it works, and I cannot stay in the community to protect my cousins. No, that's a bit too much of... Uh, <laughs> no. um, you write also... Still, we are still in the community, you have not left. There's no greater curse than the curse of childlessness. So basically, you are there as, uh, both uh, as a man and as a woman to, to, um, to have children. To yes, but childlessness is never blamed on the man. It's always the woman. Who's Only a woman can be infertile. Only a woman can be barren. It's uh, also, of course, a punishment, right? It is. Um, yeah. It is. No, I have nothing. No, you don't yes. have children, do you? No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we can discuss the misogyny within your community, but I guess there's something... We it was seen as a punishment. Yeah. So uh, if you as a woman could not produce children, you had to deal with the fact that um, perhaps this pointed to a spiritual flaw in yourself. You have to bring me the mic a bit closer sorry. to you. Yeah. You didn't want to wear a headset. I didn't, no. no. Um, also, this may be surprising to some people from uh, outside the community that, that you participated in page 56 in the anti-Zionist march every year. Because um, yeah, you write here that the Satma rabbi insisted that we had to take it upon ourselves to fight for the destruction of Israel. Mm. Even if it meant martyring ourselves for the cause. Zionism is a rebellion such as our history has never seen, said the rabbi. The idea that we could bring out about our own redemption from exile, how preposterous. Faithful Jews wait for the Messiah. Well, it's something you've pointed out already, but really was it upon you to, to, to work for the destruction of the state of Israel? I mean, as a woman, you cannot really do anything. No. You are just witness to what the men are doing. But yes, my grandfather always went to the parade, and I went along and witnessed, and uh, I saw them burn the Israeli flag, and I understood from a very young age what I explained earlier, that we swore an oath, and we had to live in exile for as long as God decided we had to, and that the Zionists were risking our permanent destruction. If they would take back Israel, God would bring the apocalypse. He will never, ever save us. So in a way, I understood the logic, you know, I understood yeah. the spiritual logic behind it. Um, but also I had very little feelings because it, Israel itself to me was so abstract. Mm -hmm. We never went. Um, I didn't know anything about it. And the Zionists to me were like far off monsters in a children's fairy tale. They weren't real. I didn't know any. And were there like the other Jewish people in New York, were there like other demo demonstrations against you march or because it's quite... Not then. Not, no, not no then. we were just considered, I guess, like freaks. I mean, later I found out that we were considered freaks. But at the time, we, we marched because everybody can march in New York, yeah. no matter how that's crazy the thing about New York. Yeah, no, that's... And people looked at us like we were insane, and then we went home, and that was that. <laughs> when was the first time you, you realized that, that your community was seen, was, if you saw, saw it from the perspective of the outside world, like a community of freaks? Well, I remember being a, a small child and sneaking into the library, and I remember that the librarian had this look on her face when I came in, like she knew what a big deal it was that I was there. And the look was a mixture of pity and confusion and presumption. And I felt so small when I saw that look in her face because I realized in that moment I was being reduced to something, that she was making assumptions that I was poor, oppressed, uneducated, uh, desperate for escape. And, and I think there was an assumption about my naivete and my, my being like everyone else in my position.
because I wore the costume, I wore the uniform, I behaved that way, I spoke the language. So I remember that was my first experience and I had many experiences as a child where I would occasionally encounter normal citizens and I would see in their eyes and the way they looked at me um, how little individuality I was able to project. So it was pretty clear just from those looks that I was being seen as a freak. And later it became very important to me to, to blend in, uh, to look like everyone else so that I wouldn't have to see that anymore. And a lot of readers commented later how ironic it was that I couldn't, uh, that there was so much pressure to conform in my community, but when I left, I wanted to conform first to Americanness because I wanted to be spared. To this be like everybody gaze. else. Yeah. yeah. I didn't want to be looked at. But basically, all the information you got from the outside world was based on the books you, you read in secret. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, in the beginning, I read like children's fairy tales, I guess you can say. And um, I describe it that all of them involved usually underprivileged or oppressed children, and there was always a happy ending for them. And so I thought, uh, that's me. I will also have a happy ending. I thought uh, Cinderella gets a prince and uh, Alice in Wonderland falls through a hole. So I was just waiting actually for something magical to happen to me as a child. But of these children you write, that, that's a dream of all the children in, in this community. Well, this, the, the quote is, what more does every child dream of than to grow up to be a rabbi or at least a rabbi's wife? This, so even you were, reading, you were reading all those books, it was still your dream to, to become a rabbi's wife at that well, time? Well, it was like the only option, like from all the options I had, that would have been the best, obviously, because it guarantees you status and respect. Mm -hmm. And that's like the most valuable thing you can have in that world. I didn't uh, acknowledge that it was possible for me to live outside the realm of those options because yeah. it just didn't seem feasible. How would I accomplish that? This is the only world I know and the only place I belong. The thought of escape did hadn't not, crossed your mind yet. Did not come no. yet, no. We go to your marriage, quite young. You skip a few pages in order to have enough time for the other subjects. This is about how you met your, um, your husband, Eli. Mm -hmm. We set a date in August, seven months from now. I won't, I won't see him more than once or twice until the wedding, and Zaidi doesn't approve of a Hassan and Kala talking on the phone. I say goodbye after everyone leaves and try to imprint his face on my mind, because it's the, own, the one thing about him I know for certain. But the image fades quickly, and two weeks later, it's like I never met him. Well, I mean, you know what it's like to see someone for 30 minutes and then try to remember their face. I mean, it's difficult. You need time to yeah, remember absolutely. a person's face. Yes. I couldn't remember the face of my fiancé. And you had to wait seven months. Yes. Why is that? Well, the fact that there's long engagement. Yeah. Um, the, the long engagement is time to prepare because you need to go to, you need to first obviously accumulate a trousseau, which I hope the word is understandable. A trousseau is an old fashioned word for what brides accumulate to prepare themselves for life as a housewife, I guess. So you have to buy everything to make a home. But you also have to go to classes, um, two kinds of classes. One is um, the, the spiritual classes you take to learn how to be a submissive wife. So you will learn the rules of how to engage in communication with your husband, how to always submit, how to flatter him, all the things that you are uh, obligated to do in your communications. And then you go to a separate uh, Kala teacher who teaches you the act of reproduction because it's uh, quite a big shock when your whole life is spent covering your body and ignoring it. Basically, you, are, you didn't know that you had a vagina. No, you don't know because you don't have words for it. and They, they still don't give you a word for it. She called, it uh, she called my uterus macaw, which means the source. the source. And she was talking about the magical almost source. almost like a science fiction movie. Yes. yes. <laughs> and then she tried to explain that to get to the source, there is a hallway and a, oh, a lot of metaphors and euphemisms. And I still did not understand what she was saying. No. And um, yes, they, she was trying to the, the teach teacher. you. Was, Correct. Yeah. She tries, she's supposed to teach you how to use your body to reproduce, but yeah. until now your body was such an evil thing. So I think it comes as a shock to many young women that what they had to hide and what they had to treat with disgust for so long suddenly becomes very holy and special and must be used in a, in a very spiritual way. Yeah. And this is a very it's, big you, shock. You were 17, yes? Yes. Yeah, you, you never masturbated. You never before that 
there's no way of, no. no. There, I mean, I really, I can look back at my 17-year-old self and I can say with absolute clarity that I had absolutely no sexuality. That it's completely stamped out of you. That's a bit late to come in. You mean sexuality? Uh, <laughs> both, both. <laughs> About the, the, you call it Kala teacher. Ka kala, kala teacher? it just yeah, means what's kala a bride. Mean it's a bride, yeah. Kala. It's a bride, yeah. You write about a Kala teacher that um, um, informs you about the pure and the less pure period. And they... Um, no, no, gives pure and impure, impure, not less pure. Less impure. Yes. That's a euphemism. Men only want what they can't have, she explains to me. They need a consistent pattern of denial and release. I don't know if I like thinking of myself that way as an object as an object made available and then unavailable for men to enjoy. Yes, that's still true. That's still true, yes. I don't like that. But that's the, maybe we can talk a bit briefly, briefly about going to the mikvah and that you explain what's a mikvah and that, this, that for two weeks uh, a man cannot, have, cannot touch his wife. Yes. Basically. So she basically explained that uh, the rules of marital purity, or they are called the rules of nida. Uh, nida is a Hebrew word that translates into um, kicked aside. And it describes a woman um, in her impure phase, which is initiated by the occurrence of menstruation and then lasts until the moment where she is able to purify herself. And this is a process of purification, which involves waiting for menstruation to stop. Then seven days of twice daily inspections to ascertain that there is absolutely no more bleeding. Inspection of the underwear. No, inspection of the vagina. Vagina. The underwear is a different problem. Okay. If the underwear has any kind of strange stain or color, you have to wear white underwear, then you must take it to the rabbi, and he will tell you if the stain is all right or not. Yes, it's true, so unfortunately. The, the male rabbi is looking at your underwear? Yes. There is even a special window where, where you, you can, can leave go. The underwear. No, you just push it through, and then he pushes it back. Interesting. Do you think he's sniffing also, secretly? <laughs> I don't know. I'm sure there are some who sniff. <laughs> I heard that your bed got sniffed the other day. My bed got sniffed, exactly, <laughs> yes. Here's another thing, yeah. So after this inspection um, of uh, seven days, twice a day, if everything goes well and n no suspicious stains were pronounced unkosher by the rabbi, then you are allowed to go to the ritual bath, which is called a mikveh. The women's mikveh is not like the men's mikveh. It's very private. You may only go in the evening under cover of dark. And in this mikveh, you have to prepare your body in a very ritualized way for immersion in a mixture of rainwater and spring water. And you are supervised during this process. And uh, this is a way that the community always was able to police uh, the bodies of women because they would then check if the hair was shaved, they would check if the woman um, was getting pregnant often enough, they would ask, they would uh, uh, see how often the woman is mentioned. There was a way of keeping tabs on every woman's reproductive life. Um, so in that sense, uh, you submitted for a kind of uh, public policing every month. And when this was done, you were free for two weeks to reproduce, uh, which happens to be at the time that women ovulate, because it's usually about 14 days, tw 12 to 14 days after menstruation. Um, and uh, after t um, two weeks, it would start again. And during the period where you were impure, your husband was forbidden to touch you, was forbidden to see any part of your body. He could not hear you sink. He could not take a plate from your hand. He couldn't sit on the same sofa as you. So you really got the impression for two weeks out of the month that you are not desired, that you are not valuable, that you are dirty. Yeah. And then for two weeks, you are holy and you must be constantly available. And this is a ping pong pattern that is very difficult emotionally because you get used to being dirty and unvaluable for two weeks and you say in Deutsch, I cannot say it in English, man kommt damit klar? How do you say this? You just, you, to, yeah, yeah, you, you figure out a way to deal with it. And then right when you figure out a way to deal with it, you are holy again. And you've got to figure out a way to get used to that. And it's very, really very stressful. Extremely stressful. Let's go to the wedding night. You describe it in a... That's your favorite part of the book, right? No. <laughs> No, Deborah. But that's uh -huh. a very funny and painful part. I think we cannot skip it. It's important. <laughs> well, for you, of course not. Finally, he pokes, I think, in the right area. And I lift up to meet him and wait for the obligatory thrust and the de deposit. Nothing happens. He pushes and pushes, grunts with the effort, but nothing seems to give way. And in fact, I can't see what shoots. What's expected to happen here? 
After a while, he gives up and rolls over to one side, his back to me. I lie there for a few moments, peering up at the dark ceiling before I turn to nudge him slightly. Are you okay, I ask. Yes, I'm just very tired, he murmurs. Soon I can hear him snoring lightly. I crawl into the other bed and lie awake for a long time, wondering if it happened or if it didn't, and what the impl implications of either possibility might be. This is the favorite passage of all male reviewers, by the way. It's not my favorite passage, okay. but I think it's an important to explain. I mean, this is, uh, it's so painful. Yes, of course, yeah. But, uh, I mean, you can see it in many ways. Yes, it's painful, it's also ridiculous. It's funny. It's conf obviously in this moment I was just very confused and was not able to see the humor. And I mean, this turned into really quite a circus in the next few weeks because every day the rabbis were consulted. What counts as being deflowered and what not? And am I impure? Am I because it's technically when you are de-virginated, you are impure. Yes. And uh, they don't have a clear definition of what this means. So we are coming back to actually quite American joke of, of just the tip. Does is this resonate at all in Holland, just the tip? Just the tip? Do you get a joke? I guess it doesn't resonate. Nobody laughs. No. Yeah, <laughs> it's, um, it's this uh, concept that uh, what constitutes um, having had sex, uh, how far along do you have to arrive, so to speak, for it to Insights. be... Insights. Yes. And so the, the, the rabbis it's ended up deciding... The rabbis ended up deciding that, uh, that we had arrived at this line or at this um, point. Yes. Although I can promise you that that is not the case. But, uh, but this was, first it was just a circus of figuring this out and then getting into this impurity and purity cycle and then each time um, repeating the efforts and not getting anywhere. Was the moment that you really loved your husband, that you really felt attracted to him? I think the, the community kind of does everything they can to prevent this because they put you on opposing sides. I mean, in a way, I was the enemy because I was the w woman that couldn't perform. It's not like we were a team and we both had to get this job done, but he was resentful of me because he had gotten this partner that did not have a properly functioning body the way they had promised him. And I was resentful of this person who had all these expectations and like, I had to make myself available to him. So the, the way that this is structured, it kind of invites uh, resentment and division in relationships instead of solidarity and teamwork. You write about your body. My body should be the one thing I can rely on. Instead, it has become my worst enemy, undermining my every effort. Yes, it's true, because my life would have been much easier if my body could have just performed its role. Yeah. And then, you know, intellectually, I still would have been free. But because I was not able to perform, I suffered a lot of additional oppression and criticism in that time. When was the time that your body ceased to be your enemy, your worst enemy? I would say that giving birth um, was a big factor in this process. And I would say that this was a long development um, that only really resolved itself in the moment where I felt in my emotional and psychological life that I had arrived. And by this I mean that I consider um, leaving this community um, as uh, the beginning of a long process of transition. And during the transition process you are very rootless. And at some point you pass through the transition process if you are lucky and you arrive at your new life, in your new story. And when this happened, I noticed that everything else fell into sync. You write actually about the day of the delivery that it is the only moment in your, in your, in your five year marriage that you was, were ever fully alive. Yeah. I mean, in the, the, in only the way moment. that like, you feel physically yeah. alive, yes, because you feel that, that your senses are very um, alive and that you are feeling things in your body because you grow up in this community and you learn to turn your body off. Yeah. And you don't feel things anymore with it. And the giving birth kind of pulls you back in. But you describe your body almost before you got pregnant as a machine. Here's a passage about what you had to do in order to get yes. pregnant. And to, and to survive that, you disconnect from yeah. your body. The first thing I must, I must do, you write, the book says, is obtain a plastic dilator kit. A series of long tubes of varying widths to be inserted as practice. The process can take months continuing until the very widest tube can be inserted comfortably. The idea is to train the muscles of the vagina to loosen naturally. Mm. 
But they didn't want to. That's the thing. You cannot train muscles that don't want to loosen. No. But you, you, you did it? Did you do it for months? This, yes, this I did, yeah. Must have been a very painful experience. It was very painful and very frustrating and very lonely. And during this time, my husband ended up having an affair because I was not able to um, prove myself. And my family blamed me for this and blamed me for my failure. And they threatened me with divorce. And they said that if my husband left me, I would be alone. They wouldn't take me in. I would be homeless and on the street. I mean, it was a very, very, very horrible time, yes. I didn't write about all this in the book to protect him and to protect the family, but uh, it was really bad. Did you st were you still able to find comfort in, in reading at that time? Was, was there no comfort at all? There was no comfort in this time, no. A bit more about the practices of, in, in, inside your community of um, sex as an obligation. Friday night, the night is the night Eli and I must have sex. It's the night everyone has sex. In the Talmud it says a traveling merchant must have intercourse with his wife once every six months. A laborer three times a week, but a Torah scholar has intercourse on Friday nights. It's almost, I, I had to laugh when I was reading it, but Why? of course, because it's so absurd. It's so, judgment. it's beyond. <laughs> it's absurd to you, to all of you, because you think of sex as something that you do on your own initiative for your own pleasure. But in this community, sex is seen as a holy act that you do with the uh, goal of producing children. The reason why a traveling merchant only has to have sex every six months is because it's understood that he is traveling and being a merchant, but he still has an obligation to produce children. Therefore, they're giving him a minimum of twice a year where he has to perform this duty. Uh, the, the thing with a, um, a Torah scholar and why on Friday nights is because Friday night is the holiest yeah. night. A Torah scholar must have holy children. So this is his obligation. Everyone has, in their own way, their own, in, uh, their own obligations. And this is completely rational for someone in my community because uh, this is exactly what sex is. It's a duty. Uh, because you're there to have children. Yes. Yeah. And can you have sex on Shabbat after lunch or that's already not holy enough? During the day you cannot do okay. it, no. <laughs> there are very strict rules. This is your favorite part, isn't it? No, no. <laughs> That's what you want to, you, you want, would like to turn me into a cliche. No, actually, I'm, you know, my, my sister is living a life that's, that's, she's not a Hasidic community, but it's a very orthodox community, so I'm very much aware of the fact that, that on Did Friday night... Did you give night, her my book? No, should I? Why not? She has already promised enough with my own books, I mean... <laughs> then um, you write about, basically, your exit. I don't want to be a Hasid anymore, I announce suddenly after we leave the shop. Well, then she says that um, you, 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 you okay. defend me, a friend. You don't have to be. You took, you took a writing course and you realized that, that you really want to step out, not halfway, completely, a clean break. Mm -hmm. Yes, I went to university. I began to study and I met people and I realized I want to be like them. I want to be as free as them. And uh, I just didn't know how. I mean, she says to me, yes, then don't be one. But I, then I said, but how? I don't understand. I, I needed to, um, to free myself and to have a life on the outside. So many things needed to fall into place. I needed to first achieve some kind of independence, by which I mean I needed to understand things like how to open a bank account and how to pay bills, which I was not trained to do. And I needed a way to support myself. I needed to find a place to live. And then I needed to ensure that my community will not come after me, that they will not try to hurt me, that they will not try to kidnap my child. How will I get custody of my son? This had never been done before. And I was not going to leave my son behind because he was the whole reason why I had embarked upon all these efforts to, to see the outside world. I wanted that he should not grow up the way I did. Basically, that's the, one of the main reasons you left the community. Yes. For your son. Yes, because you're, I think for many people who want to leave, your own self-worth is too damaged to believe that you have deserved to take this kind of step for yourself. But when you have a child, it's very easy to see a baby as completely innocent and deserving of everything. I mean, it's every mother's instinct, I think. So it was simpler, in a way, to concentrate on everything for his sake. But you also write that, that another reason to leave is that you didn't want to be ashamed of your true self. Yes, I was hiding for my whole life. I had been hiding my secret identity, the identity of the young woman who reads books and uh, who questions. And it does get very stressful, especially when I went to university and I was developing more and more independent ideas. And then coming back, I remember when Obama was running for president, I would be in college and be surrounded by the excitement of young people who were really, really 
so enthusiastic about the prospect of a first black president and then come home and have the people in my community talk about him as a monkey because he was black. There was so much racism and narrow-mindedness where I was living, and then I would have to compare it to this world that I was secretly visiting, and the split between the two was so big I couldn't live in both worlds, it became painful. That's clear. In your second book, Exodus, basically this book is also about the disappointments of the of the liberty you found outside the community. But before we go, we will talk about it a bit and then um, we'll open discussion to the public. Do you, over dinner you said that, that you were really unhappy by, by, with this edition and that, that some things were forced upon you uh, by the editor or the publisher. I was 22 years old when I sold Unorthodox on spec and I was no one. I, no one knew me and it was right after, at the point of the recession where publishers were not buying books and a very big publisher offered my agent a very strong, yeah, yeah. very strong contract for a book um, at the time when it was just very difficult and I was so young. And even then the publisher said something like, this is a very niche topic and we cannot expect people in the Midwest to, uh, to connect to this, uh, but maybe in New York. And they took a big chance, but they didn't expect anything to happen. And my agent basically was so happy that she would manage to actually get the contract that she, without even looking at the contract or advising me in any way, she just said, listen, you are young, you are no one. This is the best you're going to get. You need to just take it. And I did, and I wrote the manuscript. And of course, the first process, uh, the first time I wrote a book, I mean, you submit it to the publisher, and the publishers do exert a lot of power mm -hmm. over the manuscript, especially because I was so inexperienced and naive. And they made me, even with Unorthodox, they made me add a lot of things that I wouldn't have added, but that was still tolerable. I think what really struck me was how they ended up selling me as a product. When Unorthodox suddenly got a lot of attention, there was this feeling of I as a person or the integrity of my dignity didn't matter because what mattered was getting the book out there, and for that, you say in English, I was pimped out in, I think, in a merciless way. And I was, at the time, not experienced enough to understand the consequences of this. But I did learn a lot from it, and uh, then, you know, when I signed my second contract with the same publisher but at a different house, um, I, I thought I had learned enough to, like, keep certain rights that I hadn't managed to with that book, but I did not understand that in this industry, especially when you're already proven your success with one book, um, the publisher was determined to develop me into his personal uh, um, brand. Like, he decided who I was going to become, and he said to me, we're going to turn you into the next Lena Dunham, and you're going to write a book about the American dream. And my proposal for the second book had been nothing like that. But he didn't care. As soon as the contract was signed, he was like, this is what I want you to write about. And when I said, well, but I had something completely else in mind, yes, but this is not going to sell. And I, you need to trust me. I've been in this business for a long time, and I'm telling you this is going to sell. And these are, these are really powerful people who have the ability to make you feel um, very ignorant and very small and very defenseless. And I was, um, throughout the entire process of writing that book, under a lot of pressure to make it something that it shouldn't have been and I didn't want it to be. And... Um, I had to, f not fabricate, but I had to exaggerate certain events or interpret them and reflect on them in certain ways. That Could you give an be... example of one of these events? I think there are, there are moments in the book um, where I'm sort of trying to touch upon what they considered as popular themes uh, in pop culture at the time. And if you're thinking of Lena Dunham, and we're talking about a confessional about sex, confessional about the body, but also like um, stuff about new age or like um, new age spirituality that they thought of would, would connect with an American audience. So I was encouraged to explore um, topics artificially and to write about them in, in ways that would be considered like cool and hip and American. But actually, I'm not American, nor am I cool or hip. I mean, I'm a lot like my grandmother. I feel sometimes like an 80-year-old woman from Hungary. So it was a war in this book, and I think that's evident, a war between the things I wanted to write about and the things they wanted me to write about. And I think the book kind of goes back and forth between topics that are meaningful to me and topics that aren't. And uh, the book that I'm publishing in Germany in a month is, in a way, the book I in a week, always... A in, sorry, in a month, in a week. It's the book that I always wanted to write, that I was finally given the freedom to write by a smaller German publisher. Funny that you said you, you now live in German. You will become a German citizen in a few weeks. Yes. We'll talk about it later. 
But first, this, this, this your relationship with, with an Irish-American man, this struck me as something that was really important to you. Or, I think it was important to me in the sense that it was my first, like, You met him in New Orleans? Yeah. Yes. And it was but the first time you felt loved? You can say I fell in lust. Lust. Yeah. That's close enough. Yes, but at the time, of course, you think it's love, yeah. Because he didn't know any better. No, because I was under pressure to say that. To present it as like a love story. Interesting. This is also the reason that your new book is not coming out yet in the US, only in Germany. I am not publishing in English for as long as Trump is in the White House. And when I do publish in English again, I will be publishing with a British publisher, a smaller house. <laughs> okay, we have an yes. anti-Trump audience. Yeah, he's very popular here. <laughs> okay. But the part of the role play that was so upsetting, and it was even it was very interesting to me, we go to the back of this book. Um, mm. This is something that, that, that was not planted by your US publisher. No. no, that's something they were shocked by as well. Basically, it, uh, you, you traveled a few times to, um, to Europe in order mm -hmm. to explore also the background of your grandmother. Yeah. You traveled to Germany mm -hmm. and um, you met a few German, you met a German man mm -hmm. to whom you took a liking. Sure. Do you want to read this passage? <laughs> That's not, that's not the same passage that you're discussing. This is a... No, I know, um, but this is another man, but still. This is a, someone I met in, <laughs> in yeah. New York. But this is a German man. Why do you want me to read it? You did such a good job until now. Uh, you feel uncomfortable? No. Okay, <laughs> come on. There we go. Wow, it's so easy with you. It's easy with me. In what way is it easy with me? Well, I'm easy to... You, you push... Me. Yeah, hey, it's the same way with you, no? No. If you, 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 you don't have buttons. I don't believe you. You have many buttons. Maybe I don't know how to push them, but that's another story. What was the last thing you said? On my dress, I have, have buttons. <laughs> I, don't know, uh, I don't know how it was we got the idea to role play. It just happened. He was German, I was Jewish. We were in Williamsburg. It seemed the right moment for just such an experiment. Let's pretend it's 1939. You are a Nazi and I'm a Jewish girl you found on the street. And wouldn't you know it, he just did that. He stood up, his large fig figure blocking the light from the street lamp, and loomed over me like some cartoonish shadow. He demanded to see my papers with the straightest face I had ever seen. As I, withdrew, as I withdrew into myself in some strange, otherworldly response, he leaned closer, more threateningly, as if he was serious. I pulled my knees to my chest and wrapped my arms around them as if I could roll into a ball. Looking up at his impenetrable face, I felt inexplic inexplicably and powerfully targeted. It was real, like going back in time to some other dimension of possibility. Was this what it had felt like to some other girl who could have been me? Would she have seen someone's fury and power so focused on her and shrink under its gaze like a turtle withdrawing into its shell. To me, it, was, it reminded me a bit of, of the movie the, the, the Night Porter by Cavani, but it, it felt very natural to, to engage in, in such a role play. But at the same time, I can imagine that to some people, you explained it to me also over dinner, that when you did readings in, in the US, many Jewish people were quite upset about these passages. Yes. Right, because it, it articulates the ultimate taboo that there is a, um, a sexual charge or even like a romantic attraction to, to the forces of destruction. But for me, it's really very logical because I have struggled with the concept of being hated since I was a child because my grandparents always said to me that Jews are hated, that everyone hates the Jews and that the Germans are the worst and they hate us the most. And I was really fascinated by this uh, idea because I thought, how can someone already hate me? I have not done anything. And I uh, wanted very much to explore this hatred. I wanted to see it in another person's face and to see it up close and to see what it was like and um, to maybe to understand it better. And so I asked this person to fake it. And, um, but it didn't solve anything for me. It didn't answer my question because, if anything, it made me realize how 
if the circumstances change, then the person who is walking next to you can be the person who is oppressing you. And it began, actually, for me, a series of questions. It was a moment that opened something in me where I said, I must uh, go off in search of this, and I must understand it, and I must confront it, because I um, was fascinated by nothing so much as the negative energy focused on me by strangers I had never met. And I had grown up believing that the whole world was full of this energy. And so my desire was to go to the epicenter, to go to Germany, the place where it had all come from, and to look them in the face. And to, to feel threatened. To feel threatened and excited. Excited and Because you are so close time. to the taboo, you are so close to the danger. You know, you are brave enough to go to the lion's den and look him in the face, and there is something very exciting about that. And it's not only to give up your power, not only to be so to, in the position of submission, but also to say, I am doing this voluntarily, and at any moment I can hold it over your head, I can make you feel guilty for participating in the game. Mm -hmm. Because the, when that man stood up and, and pretended, because I asked him to, at the end, he felt dirty. Was that, was that your goal? Was that what you wanted to achieve? I think it's very complex. Yes. I think it's uh, two-sided. I think there is a goal to really re experience the, the submission that you are fascinated by, that you want to understand. And at the same time, knowing that by doing this, by being in control, by being the one who says, do it, that you are forcing the other person into a submissive role. It's interesting but because apparently uh, this is quite a common fantasy because you write also about a friend of you, a dominatrix in, in, in New York, who has a lot of Hasidic, she thinks they're all rabbis, Hasidic customers, and many of them want her to play a Nazi. Yes, they want her to dress up in an SS uniform and beat them. People from my community, it's not surprising. These are raised by Holocaust survivors and have never been allowed to process the trauma that they've inherited. And it makes absolute sense when this trauma is a part of every aspect of your life that it also enters the realm of sexual and romantic urges. Do you believe that by, by moving to Berlin that you escaped from your own trauma? I think it was the most important and critical step in the process because it created, obviously, um, physical distance between myself and my past, very helpful. I also was able to go to a city that is and has always been renowned for being a bastion for the rootless. It's a f city full of refugees in every sense of the word. And it's a city where people who have no home or no identity or no chance of belonging anywhere can really find um, a permanent sense of belonging. And so that was a way, uh, I say in, in German, sich selbst behausen, like to, to, to house yourself spiritually, to say um, this is your home and this is the frame in which you can develop. So that was a huge step and I would say this is the step that led to the end of my transition phase. It was a place, a uh, time where I felt I had arrived and I had begun living my life and I had begun having a new story, a new narrative. And um, I think the process of uh, working through trauma is probably lifelong, but I've made, I've made enormous progress. And uh, I think the best thing that has happened to me is how aware I am of the trauma and how it functions and how it plays a role in my everyday life. I'm able to constantly single out and say, I know what you're doing. I know where you come from. So let's summarize this. Growing up in a very closed community, a misogynist community, raised by Holocaust survivors, you end the transition period by moving back to Germany and becoming a German. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, my community we, sees yeah. it, of course, as the ultimate revenge and as proof that I am the anti-Semite and the Nazi that they always said I was. When my book came out, they compared me to Joseph Goebbels. So for them, this really fits perfectly. I went yeah. to Germany to become a Nazi. But, of course, yeah. yes. Um, but for me, uh, it's a lot about healing. I mean, I, you know, I have German side of my family, and I was able to do research into the side as well and to discover that uh, my, my great-grandfather, who, uh, on whose basis I received the citizenship, that he was not 100% Jewish. And this is the big uh, revelation of the book I'm publishing in German, which is figuring out what I've suspected since I'm very young, that I'm not 100%, that the way my community was obsessed with, that we are all 100% and we are not mixed, and, and there is nothing else in us genetically except being Jewish. And it uh, turns out that the big secret in my mother's side of the family was that her grandfather was the illegitimate child of a Catholic. 
and that his uh, mother had ran away from her community at a young age to live in sin with this man and raise her son by herself. And I cannot help but find a small mirror of myself in this story. And he uh, grew up completely assimilated and completely a part of Bavarian society. And then when um, Hitler came to power, he tried to Aryanize himself. He tried to uh, go to the German courts and say that on the basis of his father, he should be seen as Aryan. He tried to deny the Jewishness in himself. This did not work. I have the rejection letter that they gave him. They accused him of trying to poison the German race. Um, he was rejected. He was deported. Uh, he came back, uh, collected his wife and children, and they fled on foot to England. In England, he completely erased his past. He reinvented a new identity because he knew he had no hope of being accepted into the Jewish community if he was not 100%. The same obsession that the Nazis had with, with racial purity was echoed in the Jewish communities. And he did not want to be rejected there as well, so he created a new father. And his father's name is not on his gravestone. He's got a fake name for his father on his gravestone. And I, I found this out recently. So it was completely buried. Are you afraid that some Germans will say that you, by moving to Berlin, you are trying to poison the German race again? There are people who say this, yes. Of course, there are still neo-Nazis in Germany. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I, one thing that has struck me about uh, being a public person in Germany is that whenever I'm criticized, I'm not just criticized for my political views, but for being a Jew that has these political views. So, and for being a woman also or not? Um, well, they usually try to combine it, so they'll call me like Judenschlampe, something yeah. like this. Okay. You don't, you, but, Jewish slut. Yes, exactly. But it's so interesting, like, I'll go on a talk show and I'll talk about, uh, um, you know, Trump and Clinton and uh, I'm pretty left-wing in Germany, although I have, like, a not a typical European approach to leftist views. And uh, I'll go and talk about something totally neutral that has nothing to do with my Jewishness, but the criticism that will come from people who are, are critical is always related to me being Jewish. It's always about my nose or about the fact that I'm being paid by Soros or I'm part of a, like a world domination conspiracy. It's, it's never me as an individual. It's always, um, oh, she's Jewish and she's talking. It must be she's part of this conspiracy. I mean, there's no, there's no ability to accept uh, Jewish people in public life. It's, it's very difficult. I think if you're not a public person, you can kind okay. of ignore all that. But. It's, it's certainly strange. I've had to um, apply for uh, something called an Auskunftssperre, which means that my address cannot be uh, available to the public, which is a law in Germany, because I got so many threats uh, from people that uh, I did not feel safe anymore. Not from the Jewish community, but from the... From, from the German, from, from, the, German from, the, from the right wing community, yeah. Over dinner, Deborah, you said that you didn't want to identify as a Jew anymore. Mm -hmm. Which was... F to me, quite a shocking statement because I always thought that after 45, the possibility of complete assimilation was an illusion. And it was also like an obligation to identify, especially here, less so in New York, but especially here in Europe, to identify as a Jew. So my question is, and it's not a criticism, but my question is how are you able, were you able to free yourself? Well, I think it's a, exactly, it's a sign of being free from the trauma because as soon as you're free from the obligation, you freed yourself from the burden of the trauma, of having to do right by it. Um, for me, leaving, it was part of a process of freeing myself from, from the inner and outer limits, from the programming that I grew up with. And I have always been able to, especially in those moments when I'm reading and I feel so connected to characters in the books or to authors, I've always been able to see myself as a human being and I've always been able to see the commonalities between myself and other human beings. So it's very frustrating to be stuck in, the, in this category where I don't feel that I belong in the category. I feel that the qualities that, that can bind me to, to humans in general are much stronger and more present than the ones that can bind me to Jews. I mean, no offense, we have a lot in common, but not more than anyone here in the audience. No, I, I totally agree. I mean, also you said that you, you describe yourself as not typically uh, left-wing in the European sense of the word. One reason is that you have little patience for identity politics. That's true. I, I believe that it is very counterproductive and damaging to society. I mean, I, I go back to like Rousseau and the social contract. I believe that society is something that we build. It is not, we cannot take it for granted. It is not simply there and we all get to draw benefits without contributing. Um, I think it, it is a joint project and the joint project requires that we acknowledge our human identity first and foremost and what we have in common and everything else is second. 
And this is the only way we can build a functioning society. We cannot, I mean, what they're doing in Germany, for example, is that they're doing the opposite of the melting pot. Everyone holds onto their identity to the point where they just cling to it desperately and without willingness to accept anything else. And then the society is completely divided up into separate chunks and it's not functioning. And we have really stopped to focus on these lessons of the enlightenment and of humanism, which is the idea that to, to live in a, in a, um, an enlightened society, in a free society, to live in a free society, we need to put our differences aside and emphasize what we share, and we're doing the opposite. How can you identify, I mean, I, I I'm wholeheartedly agree, but how can you, how are you able to identify as a human being when you get threats from neo-Nazis, when you're being described as a Judenschlampe, when the outside world is constantly reminding you of your Jewish existence, of you not being a human being, but a Jewish person? Well, to me, neo-Nazis are a representation of something I already know about human behavior, namely that people do, um, are, do tend to hatred and anger and frustration. And this is everywhere, not just in Germany, it's all over the world, and we see it more than ever in America right now. So it's really not to say that I'm, I'm feeling, oh, this is a particularly German disease. I mean, we've no, got not, hatred not everywhere. Planet, no. I've learned to live with hatred. I've, learned, I've come to this point in my life where I do not desire to live in a utopia. I do not desire to cleanse the world of hatred. I simply desire to strengthen the part of society that can counteract that. And for that, I think it's important to um, de-emphasize division. I think division is not going to help us uh, serve as a, a counterforce to hatred. And you see this so clearly in the States right now. You have the right-wing conservatives, which is a group that is powered by hate, and they are powerful because they have a united voice. And meanwhile, the Democrats and the, the socialists, the left-wing groups in the states are just completely divided amongst themselves by different issues. Some of them are focusing on, on rights for gay people, and some of them are focusing on rights for women, and some of them are focusing on rights for trans, rights for disabled. They're all focusing on their little topics, and they cannot band together because they cannot see what they share. They can only see their, what, what's important individually to them. And they, they, have no, they have no counteracting force. You told me you would like to give up your U.S. passport. That's, but you can't. You can't. That's a bit impossible. Do, do you, would, you, do, would you identify as a German after you... Yes. Yes. I'm German. You're German. That's clear. It's funny when you, you say your it, boyfriend it's, is it also comes German, with so no? much shame to no, no, no. think to say German. But, but yeah, I'm German. I hope I'm not pushing your buttons, but you, ha you have a weakness for German men. Kann man sagen. Yeah. Kann man sagen, yeah. Kann man sagen, das finde ich schön. I mean, my boyfriend is not blonde or blue-eyed or anything, and he looks he more look Jewish? Jewish than me. He's oh got my like God. a big crooked nose, but Sorry. he's really yeah. great. And he comes from a region in the south of Germany where the dialect is really similar to Yiddish, so there's a nice feeling of familiarity. I mean, I, I have to... Um, underline that one of the biggest draws of being in Germany is the fact that the, the language is so similar to my mother language, that I feel a sense of familiarity and that is powerful. Can you think of Yiddish, the language, without thinking of Judaism, without thinking of your background? Yes, because I can, for example, sometimes associate it with like the secular um, writers and poets of the Yiddish movement, like um, the, uh, the playwright uh, as Ansky or the writer Sholem Aleichem, like, yeah. you know, you, you associate it also with secular arts, so yeah. possible. To end, I will, would like to quote uh, from an interview that you gave Die Welt, Henrik M. Broder, ah, a yeah. famous German Jewish um, intellectual, intellectual, I'm not sure, public Rebel persona. Rouser. Rebel Rouser. Warum will Deborah Feldmann Deutsche werden? weil ihre Vorfahren mütterlicherseits Bayern waren. Ja, aber nicht nur. Ich fühle mich sehr deutsch, sagt sie. Ich lebe in der Vergangenheit. Ich mag die alte Welt und ich verstehe die moderne Welt nicht. Sie hat Primo Levi und Jean Améry gelesen, Paul Celan und Imre Kertesch, Hannah Arendt und Nelly Sachs, Stefan Zweig und Baruch Spinoza. Welche 30-jährige Biodeutsche? Biodeutsche, was für ein Wort. Biodeutsche, die angewandte Kulturwissenschaft studiert hat, kennt diese Namen und weiß, wofür sie stehen. Deborah Feldmanns größte Ikone und ihr absolutes Vorbild aber ist eine Holländerin mit somalischen Wurzeln, die heute in den USA lebt. Ayan Hirsi Ali, deren Autobiografie in Fiddle habe sie gelernt, sich selbst zu vertrauen. Yes, I know she's not very well. Well, I told here you in, 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 in the Netherlands, she's, she's quite a controversial figure. I think I may say this. Um, so I was wondering what 
why is he was so important to you? Or I read um, the book that's in English titled Infidel shortly before I left the community. I was a Hasidic housewife and I read her story and it was for me a story of escape, a very brave story of escape. And uh, it inspired me to concretely plan my own and to believe that escape is possible. And for me, because she did this for me, she has remained a very important figure. I have not read her later books, I have not followed her, her later work. But to me, she is still the woman that accomplished what she accomplished. She managed to leave behind tremendous suffering and oppression. And she did it by any means necessary. Yes, she had to be dishonest. I mean, she had to use uh, what we would consider uh, less than dignified resources to arrive at where she has. But can you blame her in her position? Um, for me, I admired the fact that she was willing to do whatever it took to get out. And I wanted to have that quality in myself. I wanted, I read the book and I thought I want to be her. I want to be capable of what she was capable of. I understand, but later on, I mean, she started working for the American Enterprise Institute. And I cannot, I cannot deny and, and, and what she has done in the She was like an icon for yeah. the right wing. Yeah, yeah I know, and I, I don't agree, and I think it's very disappointing, uh, but I also understand the forces at work politically and how it's very easy to become pressured in, to be in one category or another. You're not really allowed to have your own politics. You have to, in order to get support from people, to fit into one political category. It's very disappointing, absolutely. But I cannot um, say that because of all the things that have happened and because of how she has uh, fallen into the wrong hands, so to speak, um, that I can now deny the value of the things that she has achieved earlier. For me, it's still very important. It's, she's still a role model um, for many people who are in my position. You cannot deny the power of that story. It, it will move people to do what she has done. And um, maybe they will learn from her future work and decide, okay, but I will not do it like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, fair enough. Two last questions, then we go to the public. I noticed that your mother unlike your grandmother, is quite absent in your work. Would you say that you're still angry with her, that you still have, that you, that you the issues no. you have with your mother have not it's been? It's just, it, there's a lack. There's really a, a void there, because when I left, I tried to uh, start a relationship with her, and the problem was that when she had gone, in order to survive, she had completely repressed the whole past, and I showed up, and I was the reminder of it, and she didn't want to talk about it at all. She didn't want to have to think about it. And I wanted explanations. I wanted to ask questions. And she wanted to pretend as if we had been normal mother and daughter our whole life. And we, she never wanted to talk about the past. For me, that was really very frustrating. I had waited a long time to finally get answers, and she wasn't willing to give them to me. And this really prevented a relationship from occurring, although I tried for five years to work on this, but... For no avail. No, it, I think it was very difficult for her because I left with my son and it was kind of a proof for her or maybe a reminder that she had failed to do what I had done successfully. And maybe she felt it was like a silent accusation or something. Does your son identify as a German? Or as a Weltburger? Weltburger. Weltburger. Next time you come back here with your new book. In German? With your German passport. Do you want us to talk German, or should I learn Yiddish for you? I mean, I, I highly doubt that you can learn to speak the Yiddish I grew up with, and if you do, it probably will be with a terrible accent. So let's just do German. Yeah? German? German. That's fine. Yeah, and then you take German. also back that I look like a... Uh... Yeshiva Bucha? No, yeah. I never take this back. You never take it back? No. I mean, maybe when you get a tan and you shave your head or something, but... Maybe that's, that's my goal then. Yeah, <laughs> tan and shave my head. Okay. So it's my hair. Well, it's Ladies and gentlemen, it's, uh, it's time for Q&A. Um, you can ask Arnon uh, anything you want. <laughs> it's all about him. No, you can ask, uh, we, you can ask questions. And Anna Marianne is walking around with a mic. Hello, my name is Kasper. Um, to me, you sound uh, rather rational and very factual. My question is, what did you do with your anger, uh, your rage, uh, your hatred? And uh, what would my anger and rage... What did you do with your rage, your anger, your hatred, uh, the gentleman is asking. But w what kind of rage or hatred do you mean, directed at what? What would I be angry at? What's done to you? What's done to you? Ah, I can explain this very easily. Um, there is not a lot of room in such a circumstance to develop uh, simple feelings of anger because imagine 
that the people who do things to you have suffered a million times more than you and are only doing those things because they're not capable of being better because of their suffering. In such a situation, you don't feel angry, you rather feel pity and you feel admiration that they have even managed to do as much as they've done. I can never be angry at my grandparents for inflicting the life that I lived simply because they went through hell and they never did anything with bad intentions. They did this because they sincerely believed they were protecting me. So the emotions here would be much more complicated than you, just you simply... You believe they're thinking. still thinking this? Yes. But they, they have, there's no contact between your grandparents no. and you? No. Nothing? No. no. Next question. Yeah. Um, I think the first row... Uh, your question is more important. I don't know. We have enough time. Wait, wait for the mic, and if, if you can say your name, that would be kind. My name is Merapi Obermeyer. Um, what kind of influence your experience has on your way of thinking about uh, religions? Have you ever heard about post-religion syndrome? Um, yes, I have, and um, my way of thinking about religion has absolutely been influenced, um, but I would say that if you could go wider than that, and you can say that my experiences have influenced the way I see all groups. So I am very hesitant to be a part of any situation that involves a group, because I am skeptical of group thinking and group identities. So this is the reason that I am not part of any kind of club, any kind of community, religious or non-religious, because I feel that uh, when people s spend too much time in groups or identify more with a group than with themselves, that things can get a bit dangerous. And it feels very uncomfortable to me after spending so much time in that mentality to revisit it. In, in uh, Exodus, you compare religion also to, to uh, being religious to being an alcoholic. Yes, it's uh, an addiction, yeah. It's an addiction. Yeah. And would you say there's a community of authors? Or this is like a... I don't, there is one, but I don't belong to them. You're the only yeah. author I think I know. I'm so, I'm so honored. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> No. <laughs> you prefer to be homeless. Yes, I do, because it's more honest. It's a good position. That's yes, a good position, I agree. if you're powerful enough. Ah, no? <laughs> speaking from personal experience. <laughs> yeah, no, I think this is, I mean, sometimes you need people to protect, you know. It's, it's, it's That's basically, why I have you. If you yeah. can choose to be homeless, and I, I'm like you, I, I, yes. I really identify with many things you said. Yes. Um, but you can do so only if you are powerful enough yourself. You accused me of being powerful I, earlier. I didn't and, accuse you. Yes, I think I said it's not power, it's resourcefulness. There's I think somewhere difference. in your books, I can look up for the quote, you write something to the, to the extent of that, you, that you are obsessed with power, that you're interested. Yes, to, to have over myself, not to lord over others. But in order to have power over yourself, you need to be strong enough to, to, to defend yourself against the other people. Yes, but the process of defending yourself against others is simply to assert power over yourself first, to have yourself as your own dominion. If you don't have that, then of course you are vulnerable for all kinds of invaders. It's like a country without an army. Of course everyone will come and plunder. We will talk about it with your next book. Alles klar. Alles klar. Next question. I see... Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if there are a few hands. Yeah, let's... I always feel so guilty when I take a question. My name is Margaliet Kleiwecht, and I was just wondering, how big was your community? About 320,000 members in New York State. But there's uh, larger communities all over the world. There's, of course, one in Israel. There's also one in Antwerp. I don't know if any of you have ever been to Antwerp. There's a community there. And there's one in London as well. There's one in California. There's some in South America. So they're really quite spread out. Next question. Two hands? Yes, Maybe we'll lady take first? one after the other. Yes, the lady's always first. Always first, yes. no? Yeah. So old-fashioned. <laughs> Mira Stark, um, I wanted to ask you, uh, how is it to um, live without love when there's not a, a word for love in the Yiddish language that you were taught? But she didn't say that. Yes, I did, I did. For love? Yes, there's yes. no word for love. Yes. We don't have Liebe. Right. So if you, if you can't even describe it and you don't experience it because of the absence of a mother and a father who is maybe not capable of giving any uh, traumatized grandparents um, a, a husband who, who clearly didn't give you any how how is it possible to survive hmm. yeah, good question 
Um, I will say that there are two different schools of thought on the impact of language and culture and vice versa. There is an older belief that if you don't have a word for something, you can't feel it, and the newer belief says that you feel it regardless of whether you have a word for it. I'm somewhere in between. The fact that we didn't have a word in Yiddish uh, for love, that I never saw a mother tell their child, I love you, or that a husband tell their wife that, or siblings say this to each other, I do believe that I sensed there was something missing, but I wasn't able to pinpoint what it was. And the reason I was able to sense that something was missing was I did have one source of love in my life, and that was my grandmother. My grandmother was, in her own way, without saying it and without showing it, a very loving person. And she never hugged me. And she never said she loved me or was proud of me, but I still felt how much she loved me by the way that she treated me, by the way that she cooked for me, by the way that she took me along with her whenever she went somewhere, by the way that she spent time with me in And she talked to me and she talked to you. Yeah. The time she spent with me? That, yes, no? it's like when, when, when a person dedicates themselves to you emotionally and, and mentally. But it's also clear that you love her. Yes, Still. I do. And this, this was like definitely a source of love that I couldn't pinpoint and say this is love. But later I was able to look back and say this was the source of love in my life and it's the reason I'm capable of loving and why the reason I still believe in it. Yeah. And in love. Uh, yes. But I have, I have to say something in defense of the Yiddish language, but because in Yiddish itself, Isaac Basif is singer, the Nobel Prize winner, wrote in Yiddish. There are mm -hmm. words for love, but only... Yes, not, uh, our Yiddish was censored yes. of words censored, that are dangerous. Yes, yeah. make this we had one word clear. in Hebrew, uh, Hava. Hava. And this was the kind of love that you feel for God that is mixed with dread, with Furcht. You say Furcht? In, uh, fear. 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 Yeah. fear and dread, yeah. And we wanted to take the question right from the lad right next to you. If you compare your, um, the Hasidic religion uh, with the more moderate uh, Jewish religion, are there any similar similarities or patterns that are... With other Jewish religions? Yeah, with the more yes. moderate. The moderate, like, like conservative or... Uh, oh, you mean like the strömung and like the, the normal... Yeah, yeah. Uh, if, if there's a normal Jewish religion, but the more... Well, there's not, there's not a normal... Nothing in, there's something not a, in no, the no, middle... There, the, there isn't, the, but let's no, say... No, religion is something that is constantly changing and being interpreted in different ways by different communities. There is no ultimate Judaism or original Judaism or true Judaism. Judaism is very diverse and it's lived in many different ways all over the world and is always changing despite the fact that Hasidim want to deny this. I mean, they are themselves a new movement. Um, so I don't believe that there is one true expression because I also don't believe in one true God. I don't believe in one true anything. It's all relative. But do you recognize something in the strict rules that is, that is in, in more interpretations? Because I was very I recognize the links between all fundamentalist religions and how they function. They seem to all function in the same way, the way that they delegate authority, the way that they're hierarchical. I, I've met um, people from different communities who say to me that although they didn't grow up Jewish, they feel they have my story because they grew up Hindu or Buddhist or Muslim or Christian evangelical. So in that sense, I think uh, all religions do tend to function very similarly. They are tools uh, of power for human beings. That's clear. We go to the next question. Um, I see a hand over there. Yeah. The lady. Wait, can I actually say I have to say two questions? Maybe? What, what's, what's your name? If you uh, say... Oh, sorry. My name is Noah. Yeah. Um, well, my first question was um, in the Jewish community in Brooklyn, to what extent were you able to develop your unique own personal identity or was there any room for that? Um, no, absolutely none. Everything was in my own fantasy, like in my head. I could not uh, talk to anyone about it for fear of being reported on and punished. And so even if there was a chance that someone else out there was like me, it was too dangerous to reach out and ask. Um, so I had to keep everything a secret, and that's precisely why the pressure builds. And when I left, I thought, I'll just get rid of my external personality and my inner one will just come out. And it wasn't that simple because I discovered that they were like knitted together and I cannot separate them unfortunately and that's the big struggle but I had a feeling that, that by reading these forbidden books you had almost a double life yes I did I had a double life yeah and in this other life you had a very individual separate identity yes I had a fantasy self but no one ever got to see it now you can <laughs> <laughs> I hope I'm not the only one one of the very few one of the very few Yes, so flattering. Uh, the first row, if we can go to the first row, two ladies, maybe the lady here first, and we go to the other. My name is uh, Monique. 
uh, is there now a change in uh, in your life experiencing uh, emotions feelings can you be surprised by your feelings and is there are there dreams or hmm. Um, there was for a long time, but I worked through a lot of that chaos. Um, I do still have um, dreams about my grandmother sometimes. Um, but I'm, I have managed to work really hard and to kind of live in the moment now, which I think is a really lovely way to live, to like really be in the present um, and to not uh, be hung up on the past or hung up on your anxieties about the future. I found that because I fought so hard to live a normal life, that, that the way I said in this interview this week, that normality, this, this, this just normal everyday life is really very, very exciting for me. And I find that I'm very caught up in, like, in the everyday activities. And I feel very present in them because I appreciate them so much. They are still so new to me. And uh, it sounds really silly, but I always miss my, my ordinary life when I'm on book tour because I, I miss the simpleness of it. What do you mean exactly by your ordinary life? Writing? Taking like, care of like, your son? Yes, cook? because you make all little decisions by yourself and nobody tells you how to do it. And you don't have to ask for permission. You don't have to call the rabbi. Every little decision I'm making myself, I decide what to eat for breakfast. I decide when I want to wash the dishes. But sometimes you have to discuss things with your boyfriend. Yes, but I keep a lot of independence there. <laughs> I see. Yeah. And one of the things you do this by living separately. Yes, it's very important for me to have my freedom. Your own space. Yeah. I think there's another lady. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Thea Fierens. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on your education, because what I understood that you were raised and educated within the community. However, later you were allowed to go and to visit the university. Or not, because no, I, I was, was a little uh, bit confused about that. I received only a religious education in Yiddish, so uh, not uh, any secular education, and I had no high school diploma. I was able to attend university in secret later when I was married, and I was able to get in without a diploma because it is under the individual jurisdiction of universities to decide if they accept you without the diploma, and they did decide to make this exception for me based on my circumstances. But it was the first uh, secular education that I received um, that wasn't self-taught, so to speak, um, and it was done in secret. I was not able to reveal to anyone that I was attending, and if it had been revealed, I would have been punished and prevented from attending. So I had to, basically, I was driving to this university, and in the car I would take off it my changed, wig, yeah. and I would put on jeans, and then I would have to go back and put it back on again. A little double life. But also you describe yes. in your first book um, how you... Uh, get also English lessons in your elementary school, and you have to read highly censored versions of... Yes, they, that's, that's quite a the funny government would come and, and force the schools at the end of the day to do like an hour of, of English, and for this they would print out like a government-mandated short yeah. story, and then they would go through it with a black marker, and all the pictures and all the words that right. were forbidden. But like things so like miniskirt was, left, miniskirt right? was censored. Yeah. You know, like really, really like harmless words. And we didn't, we could not understand the story, but that was not the point. The point was we had to practice reading the words. I'm so glad you taught us the meaning of trennen tonight. Uh -huh. We'll talk about that later. Um, yes. Uh, I'm Marijke. Uh, I've been wondering how your son is developing and how he's feeling in Germany now. Well, we left the community when he was turning three years old and he didn't remember, like shortly after he learned English and forgot Yiddish, he didn't remember anything of his past life. And the incredible thing has been that his father also became non-religious four years after I did and has remarried and uh, has another child and lives a completely secular life. And my son flies to his father twice a year to visit him. But he actually really began to flourish in Germany, probably because he sensed the same distance that I sensed. He sensed a real fresh start and he really, really is thriving. He's a very, very normal kid, something which I'm very proud of. Although probably some parents normal want kids. their kids to yeah. be special, but I think it's really amazing that my son is normal because it was so unlikely when he was born that he would have that chance. And he's doing really well in school and he's very, I think he's well-traveled and curious and has got friends from all over the world and he seems happy, you know, the Does way kids Yiddish? are. No, no, but he speaks German. Are you still dreaming Yiddish? Uh, very rarely, like mixtures. Sometimes like the German and the Yiddish mixes together into like a weird in-between kind of word. Sometimes I say 
things like I, I had to learn German by converting Yiddish into German because it, it's a bit like imagine if you grow up only speaking a German dialect, then you have to learn Hochdeutsch as an adult. You have to kind of convert everything you know into like a different pronunciation and a different conjugation. And that's what I had to do with Yiddish. But sometimes I didn't manage to make the complete transition and the word got stuck in the middle. So I'll say a word and it's not really German and it's not really Yiddish, but it's in between. New words. Yeah, yeah. it's like, like an in-between language. I don't know. It's nice. Yeah. My secret language. Again, not a secret life, a secret language. Uh, a few more questions and then we... Wrap it up. We wrap it up, exactly. My name is Thea Cohen, and in spite of what Arnon said, I like to say that I was very impressed to listen to you, and thank you, and I think you're very brave and courageous. And uh, my question is, um, the family you grew up in and the system, the rigid system, um, you think that's representative for the more families of these 300,000 in uh, Oh, I think it's Brooklyn? more lenient. Sorry? I or think it's actually m one of the more lenient ones. I think the most of the families are much more rigid than my own. Oh, yeah. the other question is, um, is this um, the same community as the Chabad is? No, they are mortal enemies. <laughs> Chabad, you, you should explain Chabad, a bit, Chabad is the Lubavitch, Chabad Jews no? are the Messianic yeah. Jews. They believe that uh, their former rabbi never actually died, but went up to heaven like Jesus and will come back at any moment because he is the Messiah. And this is considered by other Jewish communities as heresy because you cannot declare the Messiah, only God can declare the Messiah. So they broke apart from most of the uh, Jewish world and practice a messianic uh, missionary Judaism that is seen as very suspect and uh, by the Satmar is seen as positively evil. Are they just as you think? In their own ways, in, in different categories, yes, I do believe. But they are um, very schooled in the art of PR. They are taught from a young age how to speak about their lifestyles in public and how to what, do what I call whitewashing. They are told that it's okay to lie about Judaism if it helps bring Jewish people closer to God. And so a lot of the work that they do involves um, being deceptive about what it is they're trying to sell. And I find that very problematic. And also they have like the Lubavitch in New York, they have the mitzvah tank. Yes, they try to go around and... And try and, to convert. Yeah, that's something yeah. that normally Jewish people do not do. They're yeah. the only ones yeah. that do that. Let's do the Lubavitch. Yeah. Okay, two last questions and then we go home, I assume. Uh, or at least we go to the cafe. Yes, uh, I heard you say, and I rephrase, uh, I didn't put things in the book to protect my husband and to protect my family. And my question is, why are they still deserving of your loyalty? No, it's not that they're deserving of my loyalty. It's like, in a way, to protect the dignity of yourself as an author and also to protect the dignity of my son. Like, there are just certain things that weren't 100% necessary. And I wasn't going to include something just because I had a vendetta or just because I was angry at people. I was only going to include things that were absolutely necessary to the story. I still understand that my son is a product of, uh, of myself and my husband, that he's a product of both our families, and that he is also affected um, by this work, as am I. And it would be harming to myself if I use these books as an opportunity to spill every grudge. When you wrote this, this book, the first book, on Offenbergs, were you conscious about the, reaction, the reactions you would get from, from your community? Yes, theoretically I was conscious, but obviously it's very difficult to translate that into the practical consequences. Okay. I think we're taking one more, right? One more and then we are done. You can eat your cheese. <laughs> Ach so, yeah. Ach so. Uh, thank you. Um, I was wondering... What's your name? Oh, Noah again, sorry. Noah again, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was wondering um, if you ever wish you were brought up in somewhere in Germany as like a normal girl, normal German girl. I never like wanted to be a normal German girl, but of it's course I wanted Nazi to be post. normal. <laughs> um, but now I... Um, it's sometimes strange to imagine that because then you know you wouldn't be the person that you are, so you feel very disconnected from that possibility. I think I'm pretty happy now in my life that I don't spend a lot of time wishing that things were or had been different. So that's, that's good, right? You accept? Yeah, I, f yeah. I feel pretty happy, yeah. It's I mean, so we are good. both afraid to say that we are 100% happy because we are afraid the devil will come and smite us, but... <laughs> the devil. Never say that you're happy, exactly. Never, never. Yeah. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you for being here. I wish you a happy evening. Um, don't think of me as a yeshiva bocha. I beg you. And uh, we will be again here somewhere this fall. The program is not yet sure, but not yet clear, but um, it will be announced. 
Then we will come back. Surely. Let's give each other a hug. Thank you. Thank you.